<laughs> what um what provoked the move um to San Francisco? Well, I was with a band called the Frantics, and uh, you know I had played with Bobby Fuller down there in Texas for yeah. a while, and then I came up here. I was playing, but basically with organ trios, kind of bebop, and then I got with the Frantics. And we played a couple of years together, and then we got a chance to go to San Francisco. And so I wanted to travel anyway. So we went down there, and uh, it just happened to coincide with the day that uh, uh, topless became legal there. <laughs> so they didn't they didn't give a shit about rock and roll bands. So they. You know, we ended up playing for the tits, <laughs> for uh, topless. Ba, 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 da, 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 da. I heard you that know, the, the, the yeah, I heard the Grateful Dead used to do that too. They used to play the topless oh, yeah. bars. Well, you see, that's the thing too. So we came home that time, and then we went down again and played a place called Hunter's Inn in Santa Maria. And on the way home. We happened to stop at a place called the In Room in Belmont, California, and the Warlocks were playing. <laughs> and uh, they were just about to change their name to the Grateful Dead. And we started talking to Garcia, and he said, you guys got all your equipment with you? Bring it in, play some. So we had the B3, we went in and played a couple of West Montgomery tunes. And uh, they said, hey, we know where there's a Victorian. You guys can have it on Ralston Avenue. And so we said, well, hell, we were on our way home, but I guess we don't have to go home now. So that's that's like uh, 63 or 64 or something like that. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, I finally got home in 95. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a slight distraction, you know. Well, you were in San Francisco at 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 the the that was pretty much the epicenter of the of the world culture at that time in the mid '60s. Um, well, yeah, it, it it became that, but we were there early. Yeah, and and uh, so at first we started playing places like the Dragon of Go Go, where we all dressed alike and played everybody's tunes. You know, Sam and Dave. Uh, Righteous Brothers, Beatles, Rolling Stones, on uh, doing steps, doing stick, doing everything. And then we got a load of what was happening on the hip scene, like at the Longshoreman yep. and the Psychedelic Experience. And we looked over there and said, these guys could play their own music. And we said, hey, that's the way we want to go. We dumped, we dumped the clubs. And we split up. But me and Don stuck together and got a place in San Carlos. And Bob went to L.A. and bumped into Peter Lewis. Yep. And Bob and Peter called me and Don up and says, we need a guitar player and a drummer. So I said, well, you got him. So they got us. And then they, Peter knew this guy, Matthew Katz, who became my manager for a while. And he had Skippy Spence with him, who had just left the airplane, Jefferson Airplane. Yep. So, so uh, the five of us started playing together, and it was just plain old magic. Yeah. What uh, best I ever, ever had been involved with, and we were so tickled. Said, "Now this is a band that that means business," and everybody wrote, everybody sang, everybody played. And everybody got along real good, and we had a ball. What do you that's how it all started. What do you remember most about San Francisco at that time? What's what sticks out for you? Saw the Fillmore mostly, and the gigs in the park. You know, those were great in the band shell. Uh, playing over in Sausalito at a place called the Ark. And then right next to that was the, the Hillifort where everybody practiced. Yeah. And that would be Janice with uh, Big Brother, Quicksilver Messenger Service, yep. uh, 
That would be uh, Buffalo Springfield, uh, all the bands, Lee Michaels. And so you'd go from one one uh, cubicle to the other one and see how stoned you could get. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It was a real trip. It was great. But we would, we would play from six till six. Yeah. <laughs> in Sausalito. And then we, then we all decided to move up there. And then Bill Graham took a hold of us, too. And uh, uh, Chet Helms from the Avalon. Yep. And they, they took a liking to us. So pretty soon we were popular with, with everybody. We were dragging them in. And then all the record companies wanted to sign us, but we went with Columbia with David Rubinson and recorded that first album on the West Coast, which was great. Super duper. And, and, you know, we rehearsed the shit out of it before we went in the studio. And we learned a lot about the studio. And so that's, that's a movie great. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. now you're 73. I think you're, as far as I was reading, your birthday's coming up soon. Um, yep, yep. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Never be thinking to be an old man. Well, um, <laughs> but I'm still full of piss and vinegar, and my health is good, so <laughs> I'm you, happy about that. Do you see any rebirth in your uh, thought process or, or outlook on on the world these days? Or every day, every day. I just got back from California, down there writing, and I I played uh, two days ago with Elvin Bishop for oh, a wow. great big crowd. Wow, and. And then uh, Phil Moore Slim was actually there too, who is in mentioned in Hey Grandma. Yeah. So that blew his mind when I told him about that. And uh, you know we had uh, Betty Levette was singing uh, before Elvin, and that was good. And then I had a gig the night before that which was fully packed and everybody was screaming. I had a, a really great amp down there because I can't take my amps with me down there because yeah. I fly. Yeah. But, but it's been really great, the reception we've been getting. And then Peter called me just recently uh, and him and his daughter have been working and uh, they wanted to put something together and go out and do it as Moby Grape again. But I'm a little bit leery about that. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. I don't know. What does it mean? But I told him if the money, if the money is right, <laughs> and uh, and all the transportation is taken care of, and I teach up here too, you see. Yeah. And I I'm playing tonight. I just get on a, just got home on the plane. Had to get up at five this morning in California, and uh, so I'm playing tonight. Then tomorrow is a teaching day. And then Thursday, I have a gig at the biker bar, Uncle Sam's. And then Friday is another teaching day, where it's also a, a good payday, too. So I'm getting by with all of that stuff. But if something comes up to where I can come to the south southeast, I'd just love to come down and see you guys. Oh, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> what, what, does it still yeah. mean, what does it still mean to be kicking ass on stage these days? Oh, it just still tickles the shit out of me. I mean, that's the best there is. Don't you think? I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, you're a musician, right? Yeah. Uh, more yeah, of a more of a writer better. than a musician, but... Oh, yeah. Well, hey, uh, we have to write something together then. Because yeah. I love to write with people. Yeah. Well, uh, my final question hey. um, for, for yeah. now, my final question is, what is a life playing music and, and traveling the world and meeting people and creating... Um, what does that touch about what it means to be a human being? Oh, it's just a growth pattern, you know, and, uh, you know, it gets political from time to time, but nowadays it's so nuts. In those days, we were just trying to get the boys back from Vietnam, and, you know, a lot of benefits for people, and still, we do a lot of cancer benefits because there's some damn much cancer out yep. there. Yep with my band and uh, every day I'm reading about another one of our compatriots kicking a bucket yeah. <laughs> you know so time to haul ass and uh, but 
that's a nice legacy to have done that first Moby Grape album. I'm very proud of that. And there's there's parts of the rest of them that I really like too. What, but what, the first album is the best. What's the legacy of Moby Grape? Huh? What's the legacy of Moby Grape? Yeah, I think that's remained to be seen. As as it goes on, people get more and more aware of it. It's very funny. As uh, you know, it's the strangest places. Somebody will say, you, you say you're, he's from Moby Grape. And, Moby Grape? Shit, I got my music started from that. <laughs> like uh, Garth Brooks. His mother took him to see Moby Grape, and he decided to be a musician. <laughs> That's amazing. Ain't that something? Yeah. Well, hey, do this something. Well, hey, Jared, yeah. it's, it's been great talking with you, and I hope we can uh, stay in touch, especially if you want to come down to the South. Yeah, let's do that. I got a couple of releases coming up, and as soon as it's ready, I'll make make sure I got your address and stay in touch, and I'll, I'll get you what we're up to these days. That sounds good. What I'm up to. <laughs> well, you have a good That's afternoon, cool. then, and we'll stay in touch. Well, you betcha. We will, indeed. Well, have a good one. Okay, thanks, pal. Bye. Take care.